new childhood. I remember I had two loving parents. There were three of us brothers, three of us sisters. I remember we did the best we could, but childhood like you're talking about, no. Were there any games I liked to play? No. You see, we were very busy. In the morning, we went to public school. In the afternoon, we went to Hebrew school. Everything was either work or study. Once we were old enough, we worked to make money because otherwise we were very poor. Did I play any sports? No. But I learned how to run. You see, in a small town in Poland, I, I think the first thing they taught those children was how to throw rocks at Jews. So every day at the end of school, all the Jewish children would line up at the door. And as soon as it opened, we'd run home. Because otherwise, My name is Ruben Steyer. I was born February the 28th, 1926, in a small town in Poland. We didn't know much about what went on elsewhere in the world. It's not like we have what you have today to find out. All of that changed on September the 1st, 1939. We actually didn't live very far from the German-Czech border. So we knew when the war broke out because we could hear the shots. It was a very beautiful Friday, but I remember it got dark very quickly. <clears throat> we decided to take what little bit we could and evacuate. I don't know where we thought we were going. <clears throat> we walked all night, and since it was Friday and we were all very religious, we stopped. We said our prayers. We had a little bit of something to eat, and we went to sleep. Saturday, the Germans caught up to us. You're free. We're here to help. You can go home. You don't need to run. They said. And so not knowing any better, we turned around and we went back. On Sunday, all the Jews were detained. You went to the right and went home. You went to the left. 272 people died that day, and their only crime was being Jewish. On Monday, we went to the center of town, the only synagogue. We were asked to bring everything out and burn it. From that day forward, we had new rules every day we had to come learn. I wasn't good enough to walk on the same ground as a German. So I'd have to get in the gutter if I saw one coming. In the spring of 1940, they rounded us all up. And they moved us to the biggest slum area of town they could find in the ghetto. Now, we were three of us brothers, three sisters, my two parents. That's eight people. They packed us all into a room. It's probably no bigger than one of your bedrooms that you have today. We had one bed. My mother and my youngest sister slept there. How do you live like that? There was no industry. There was no way to make a job. There was no way to get extra food. So my brothers and I became the family sole breadwinners. We would slip out under the fence and we would steal or barter for whatever we could. That was in the summer when the weather was nice. What do you do in winter when it snows and you leave footprints? I would literally pray for a blizzard so that our footprints would be hidden and we could go and we could find something. 1942, I was 16 years old. They were starting to liquidate the ghetto. And they were coming from my father, so me and my two older siblings, they went to hiding. Reuben. You'll be fine. You're only 16. Nothing's going to happen to you. Just stay home. You'll be fine. We won't get you. How wrong we were. They came, and when they didn't find my father, they took me. 
That was the last time I saw my mother and my younger siblings. I also never saw my father again. They took me to a forced labor camp. They took away my freedom. They took away my family. They took away my clothes and they gave me theirs. They took away my name and they gave me a number. I was literally moving mountains into valleys, just digging holes for the sake of digging holes. I still don't know why they had me do it. At night, we had a curfew, but we didn't have indoor plumbing in those days, so they, they left us with a bucket. The next year, they transferred me to a concentration camp. And the difference here, so in the forced labor camp, we were guarded by three men. And it wasn't so bad, they kind of left us alone to do our thing, they made fun of us a bit, and the conditions were hard, but... The concentration camp was guarded by Hitler's elite, the SS. You wouldn't believe the brutality. And they took pleasure. The punishments were much harder. They had dogs that were trying to just tear people apart. You probably don't believe that, but it's true. And sometimes in the middle of winter, they'd help us go out there with nothing. None of the things that your parents won't let you leave home without. And just stand for hours. Now if I told you that I went out in the middle of winter, and it's much colder than winter usually is here, and I didn't have a coat, I didn't have gloves, I didn't have a scarf, I didn't have good shoes. Sometimes I, I was naked, and I didn't even catch a cold. Would you believe me? I wouldn't, but it happened. Towards the end of the war, they started moving us further in. We marched for three days, and then they piled us onto a train. They gave us each a loaf of bread about the size of a brick. They packed a hundred of us into the car. And of course, there was the infamous bucket. As people died, we dragged them to the middle of the car to make room for the rest of us. As the bucket began to overflow, but we were exhausted from we standing, and the only thing to do was sit down in the overflow. Now, that's not something you get used to. It's just something you suffer through. You wouldn't believe the stench. Can I describe it? No. If I have a pain, how am I going to describe that to you, and how can I describe this, and you never, never believe it? I do remember one man, and he was just going on and on, and moaning, and groaning, and just in pain, and he just wouldn't stop. And I wanted him to stop. Eventually he did. Now, I had noticed this man, because he was so sick, still had a small scrap of bread. The rest of us were long since out, because all we had was that one little brick for all these days. So when nobody was looking, I checked to make sure no was watching. I snuck up, I took that bread, and I ate it. I'll never forget that I ate that dead man's bread. But it might have saved my life, I don't know. The only difference between him and me is death. Give you another idea of what that was like. They put a hundred of us onto a car. After a few days, ten of us walked off. They took us by truck to Bergen-Belsen. Now you've probably heard a lot about Auschwitz and the gas chambers. Bergen-Belsen didn't have any of that, but it was still an extermination camp. 
didn't need gas chambers. They just let nature run its course. Our meals used to consist of, you know, a little bit of bread and a cup of so-called soup. After a while, they took the bread away, I guess, just to speed things up. My job was to drive the bodies to the graves every day. Now, every day there were more and more transports coming in. One day, near the women's side of the camp, where I was working, was on the border. I heard my name. Reuben! It was a voice I hadn't heard in almost three years, my older sister. You'd think I would be happy about this, to know that she was still alive, because I had assumed that my entire family was dead by now. I knew what it was like. But now, I knew she was there. I knew there was no way she got away. I was worrying about her every single day. Was she getting enough to eat? No. Were they treating her okay? No. And every day as I was working, the body was laying face down. I'd turn it over and make sure it wasn't her. Luckily, it never was. On so-called Liberation Day, I was as close to death as you could be without actually being dead. I remember the soldiers came in and they gave us all some food, a little scrap of bread, tried to give us something because it was all they had. But I, I was as close to death as you could be, so someone stole it and I was too weak to fight them off. And then I sat down and I never got back up again. I didn't know for years what happened. I was in a coma for quite a while, but as it turns out, my sister told me many years later, um, when she found me, I guess somebody she knew told her or something, I still a little bit foggy. I was naked, so they had stolen my clothes. So my sister, to give me some dignity, removed her underwear and gave it to me, so I had something. It took me seven months to get my skin color back to normal, from all the dirt and grime. It took me three years to completely be out of the woods with my health. And it took me much, much longer than that to really feel okay again. And I told you at the beginning our family was religious. We went to Hebrew school, we stopped to say prayers even when we were trying to get away. Today, I guess you'd say I'm more than agnostic. I question everything. I have a wonderful family, a wonderful wife and children, and my two daughters went to Israel. And they went out to the top of the Masada, and they were in awe of everything that they saw, and they sent out this prayer to God, and they said, God, how could you let this happen? They didn't get me. I tell you these things not so that you feel bad with me, not so that you can be angry and hate. If I hate the Germans, even those that weren't involved, if I hate the Poles, even those that, even though I never met one, maybe there were some good ones, I'm the one who suffers, not them. They don't know. I would suffer if I carried that hate, so I don't. I don't tell you this to feel bad for me. I don't tell you this to try to make myself stand out from anybody else because really I don't know how I survived. The only thing different between me and them is death. But we can't let these things happen ever again. The Holocaust is what happens when the people stand by and do nothing. And thank you for listening to my story, because that's really the greatest gift that you can give, is just listening. <laughs>